PTF back with you in the bunker for Monster Pod Part 2. Bunch more great guests with me and uh, Jonathan Kinchin asking the questions, giving you unique insights in all these three videos to every contender in this year's Kentucky Derby, and even some non-contenders. After last year with Rich Strike, I'm not sure who I'm confident calling a non-contender. We go all the way out on the AEs. We have a lot of fun. Tons of free content on our YouTube channel. Please rate, review, subscribe over there. Leave a comment. Do all those things. Tell a friend. If you want even more, you can check out the podcast, clearly, in themoneypodcast.com for that one or wherever you get your shows, in the money media. And, you know, if you want to support stuff we do, um, please sign up for our In The Money Plus package. You'll get a grid of all the picks from key contributors. You get a bunch of extra content as well on there. It's only uh, one month to get all the Derby stuff. Doesn't cost much, supports the channel, and most importantly, gets you a lot of key content. More write-ups on individual bets, et cetera, et cetera. Also, want to direct you to our pals at the Preakness Future Wager. That's the Black Eyed Susan shirt. You can bet on that now. Express bet or first bet. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Next up on the show, a regular guest we always like to check in with, with all the biggest moments in thoroughbred racing and, you know, none bigger than the Triple Crown, which he uh, covered uh, as the lead reporter for many, many years for the Daily Racing Forum. This year he gets to maybe enjoy it a little bit more. I wonder if that's fair to say. We'll ask him here to talk about Tappet Trice. We have Hall of Famer Jay Priven. What's going on, Jay? Hey, Pete. How are you? Things are good, man. How are you? How are you enjoying this Triple Crown season? <laughs> uh, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I'm not. I'm not on deadline. I'm just enjoying it as a fan. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy the Derby, not having to uh, turn around and write a story when it's over. So it'll. It's going to be an enjoyable and, and certainly different way to take in the Derby this year. You've got a lot of horse player in you. And when I first asked yeah. you who you might want to speak with for this monster pod, you had more than one answer. Um, why was Tapatrice in that mix? Well, I just think he's a horse that's progressing. Uh, I like the way he moved forward from the Tampa Bay Derby to the Bluegrass. I thought his Bluegrass was certainly an improved race. I think there's some intriguing positives, but as well as a, one fairly significant negative about him. And I just thought he was an interesting horse to talk about. Let's do the plus side first. You mentioned how he's developing. I thought, you know, overcame adversity the last day. You always like to see that in a derby runner. Given the bloodlines, you think the distance would be no issue. What else are you seeing that, that that's a positive for this horse? Or, or is it mostly just those fairly obvious things that, that stamp him as a contender? Yes, yeah, certainly that. Uh, I think the distance is right up his alley. Uh, I, I don't think he'll have any problem with the mile and a quarter. I think even the, the mile and a half of the Belmont on those sleeping terms at Belmont Park is going to really be right up his alley. But I, I just like the progress he made from the Tampa Bay Derby, where he looked like he might have struggled a little over that surface, and it took him a while to finally find his best stride, to then move on to the bluegrass and be a little more tactical. He's still not super tactical but but he was more so that day and he ran down a, a quality colt and verifying and beat him on the square when i thought verifying had everything his own way that day so i thought it was a, a strong effort on the part of tapatrice what gives you pause i mean we're talking about a horse who's going to be no worse than the third choice in the market depending on what happens in the hype train of a certain japanese runner but uh probably your second choice right now in the future books your consensus second pick is your knock enough to, to make you question that position in the marketplace i'll let you know after the draw uh i know usually the post draw is kind of laughed at and considered overrated. I actually think in this specific case for this specific horse, it's paramount. I don't think this horse wants an inside draw in a 20 horse field because he's not usually real quick away from the gate. And in the bluegrass, he had a, a, an inside post, but he was able to work out a, a trip. And maybe he can do that again in the derby with an inside draw, but it's a bigger field. It's a little more chaotic. And I think he, with the way he runs, he's kind of a one-paced horse, a big grinding horse who just keeps coming at you. I don't think you want to get him stopped. And so I think a middle to outside post is going to be advantageous for him, and an inside draw could be a compromising spot for him. So that's, to me, a real significant thing to look at come draw time. 
What about the price for Tapatrice? You know, depend, assuming the draw that you want, what, what kind of a number would you be looking at to make this horse more of your A-level contender and versus a horse that you might try to slightly fade if he's uh, over that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want anything less than four uh, in a race like this. There's certainly a number of horses that are contenders here on a fig standpoint. It's a pretty well-bunched group at the top. Uh, there's not, not a real standout here. So I think that would be a fair price. I would think in this field with as many contenders as there are, you'd get it, but you just never know how people might react uh, come Derby week based on final workouts and, and things of that nature. So that would be the, the minimum I would take on him. I know you had strong opinions about the favorite in here as well, Forte. Give me your quick take on him. Yeah, he's a horse that I'm starting to fade a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, the Florida Derby, Pete, to me, was a race you could look at one of two ways. He, he washed out before the race, but it was a warm day there. It took him a while to finally get rolling, and he, and he did at the end of the race run down Mage and, and win the race. The, the thing that – to me, there were two ways to look at his race. One was, boy, that wasn't his sharpest performance. Is he tailing off? The other is, boy, he wasn't even on his A game and he still won. That's a, that's a feather in his cap. So to me, coming out of that race and watching his breezes was going to tell was going to tell the tale for me. And I wasn't crazy about his first work back. It wasn't bad, but it, it just wasn't sharp. And he just didn't look like a horse who was continuing – to progress. That doesn't mean he can't win the race, but when you factor that in at the expected price, to me, he's a horse I'm, I'm looking to try and beat. We got word this morning that Skinner will be making this field. This was another runner you had comments on. Is this one that you were uh, interested in as a long shot or, or another you had a question about? No, he's very much a horse that I was looking at uh, in a positive manner if he were to get into the race. I have the utmost respect for his trainer, John Sheriff. So I think is just brilliant at bringing a horse along and using prep races as they are labeled as preps, yep. as building blocks towards a major goal. Uh, I've seen him do it countless times. Obviously everybody's familiar with what he did with Giacomo for the Derby, but there's so many other horses that he's trained over the years who he's used prep races to get to the final goal and have them at their best that day. And to me, Skinner was an intriguing horse if he were able to get in. Uh, he's now in the body of the field, and I think he's I think he's a very, very live long shot in this race. Love to get that info. Of course, we are sponsored today by our friends at uh, the Preakness and the Preakness Future Wager, which folks can bet on. And, uh, Jay, you have some money allotted to take a swing in the Preakness Future Wager. First, I want you to tell us why you don't want to – put that risk on a tap of trice and then tell us where you want to go. Well, Todd Pletcher's MO over the years has been, if he wins the Derby, he runs back in the Preakness, but if he doesn't, he waits till the Belmont. So, you know, unless tap of trice wins the Derby, he wouldn't even be in the Preakness. And if he's in the Preakness, he's going to be a short price. Right. So, uh, I, and I think he might get some play in this Preakness field just because he's a name right now. But I think if you sort of look at, Todd Pletcher's MO over the years. He's not a horse you want to be getting behind at this stage as a, as a Preakness future bet. So my angle here, Pete, was to look at horses who maybe don't make the Derby field and now have to point for the Preakness uh, and might be at their best that day and are going to kind of fall through the cracks. Give us who you landed on. So uh, I thought Mandarin Hero ran a terrific race in the Santa Anita Derby, and he is the horse that I would – uh, most prominently want to use in here. So uh, of the hundred dollars, I decided to split it 50, 50, uh, part of half of it on Mandarin hero, uh, who's going to point for the Preakness. Uh, he doesn't look like he's going to get into the Derby field. And then the other horse I would look at is instant coffee, who has been one of the better three-year-olds, but threw in a clunker last time and, and didn't make the Derby field as a result of that. But obviously in a top barn of Brad Cox, and now he's going to be freshened and, and, looks like point towards the Preakness next. And to me, he'd be an intriguing horse there. And I think both these horses have the potential to fall through the cracks and be decent prices, which is what you want when you're making a future wager. And we've seen before Cox be able to take a horse out of a, a seemingly subpar effort and run very big in a classic, though it didn't count for paramutual purposes with Mandaloon the other year. <laughs> 
Last question for you. You've mentioned positive things about Mandarin Hero, positive things about Skinner. I'm guessing you think the form of that Santa Anita Derby is pretty good. What chance do you think the winner has on the first Saturday? In yeah, practical move is rock solid. Uh, he, I thought, ran uh, a, a sharp race in the Santa Anita Derby. He's really progressed since the Los Alamitos Futurities. Come back and run two excellent races as a three-year-old. The, the, the only reason I didn't mention him is like, a horse that I'd want to gamble on in the Derby is that I just feel that he's probably going to be underlaid. And I thought he was the beneficiary of just ideal trips in both of his races. The thing is though, he usually works out a good trip because he's, because he's tactical and that's an important aspect of him. So I greatly respect him. He will absolutely be on my exotic tickets for the Kentucky Derby because he fires every time. Great stuff, Jay. Can't wait to talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me on Pete. I really appreciate it. Shawnee Roy. What's going on? What's happening, my man? Oh, you're being much nicer than you were when we were off camera. Well, you know, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk a little verifying. Um, let's do it. When we, when, we, when, we, when we looked at doing this, uh, Pete said that you were interested in verifying. I hadn't even talked to you about it yet. So tell me why. Uh, well, uh, mainly because the, the bluegrass was a – pretty fast race um actually i've got it as the fastest um u.s prep and i thought he ran really well in there did a lot of the dirty work and, and you know couldn't hold off tabit trice but you know when i look at his pps he's just sort of steadily getting better and running more efficiently and faster overall so I, you know i think he could get a pretty nice trip given especially given like an outside draw i'd love to give you know have him draw outside and be able to sort of create his own trip. Um, wouldn't necessarily love him if he drew inside as much, but you know, I see no reason to, to not bet him over tap at trice if the odds are as sort of skewed as it seems like they may be. If he's three times the price, you know, that's the bet between those. Yeah. Two. And, and, and Sean, you, you, you talk about, we talk about speed figures a lot. Um, you make your own speed figures. Not only do you do a final time, you also do uh, a late pace number where you really highlight the, the later start uh, stages of the race um, from a numerical standpoint. I'm, I'm assuming verifying has a good LP, which would result in him handling the extra uh, eighth of a mile. Yeah. It's, you know, I think it's good enough. It's not um, outstanding. It's not, a triple digit LP. Um, but for a horse with his running style and his sort of internal figures, it's, it's good enough. And he's improving it while also improving the internal splits as well. So he just seems like a horse that's getting better and better. And, you know, I don't, I don't see a reason why he couldn't run a triple digit late pace figure. And then sometimes, you know, I like to see that and I prefer that, but you don't have to have it either. I mean, there have been plenty of derby winners that, that haven't run a triple fit, uh, digit LP, um, especially ones with his sort of running style. So he, you know, he ran like a 93 with triple digit internal splits, um, 93 late pace figure. So that's, that's good enough to me. So if you like verifying, I'm assuming that you are also interested in tap at trice a little bit. I mean, at least to, to be involved that mm -hmm. you might not like him at a win at a win bet situation, but um, is he a horse that you'll use as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that was a good race. I think they're both real contenders, uh, both sort of must uses in exotics. If you're, if you're playing exotics, especially verticals, um, you know, they would be two of my top four choices, I suppose. We got you here. I guess we got to ask you a little bit about uh, Forte. What are you going to do with Forte? It really depends on the price. Um, you know, I think he's, I think he's very solid, but he's not necessarily faster than the rest of these. Um, and I, I'm not sure he's really improved from two to three, like some of these others have. So, you know, if he's two to one, for some reason, he's a toss. If he's four to one, I think he's a use. Um, but it's really just, you know, what the tote board says about him. And, you know, I guess, you know, what Mattress Mac does with his money um, will probably push me one way or the other on him. I imagine on 
fifty percent of my tickets, I'm going to try to beat him just because he doesn't really stand out to me, and and will be a shorter price of the of the contenders. Shawnee, this uh this monster podcast is is sponsored by the Preakness Future Wager, a uh, new wager that they put together, which seems like a lot of fun. Who who do you want? To, we've got a hundred dollar wager for you. Uh, who do you want to bet your Preakness Future wager on? It doesn't have to be verifying; it can be whoever you want. I mean, it's tip, you know verifying. I think fits the Preakness well, running style wise. But I sort of sort of doubt he goes there if he doesn't win the Derby. Just doesn't feel like something Cox is going to do. Um, so I don't know, that makes it tricky. I I'm gonna say I like I like Angel of Empire the best of these of this crop so far. So I'll just I'll just say him. Um, with a little confidence, I don't know because I, I if he didn't win the Derby, I'm not sure he'd go either. So it's uh, it's it's that's a tough that's a tough uh, decision, I guess. Angel of Empire, it is, my friend. I love you. I'll see you next week. All right, bye-bye. See you. Little off-camera joke from my friend Frank McGoey. Frank, what's going on? Oh, getting ready, getting excited about getting back up to Louisville, um, seeing all the improvements in the facility and, uh, and starting another streak. I, uh, I think it, so we missed the last two years, um, what, three years, whatever it is. I can't remember with all this stuff, but, um, I had made like 12 in a row before that. And so we got to get it cranked back up. Um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time at fairgrounds. I, I consider, I, I always tell friends when I, when, when we talk about a race at fairgrounds and, and I say, Hey, I like this horse at fairgrounds. The, the guy who I think is the best fairgrounds horse player, handicapper said he likes this horse. You're who I'm talking about. I want to talk with you a little bit about two fills. Who's who was in the first two legs of the kind of the Florida, I mean, excuse me, the, the fairground series um, in the LeCompte and the Risen Star, but then went on to, to Turfway to win on the synthetic. What do you think about two Phil's chances in this Kentucky Derby? You know, in, in mentioning what you just said, I, I, and I think that that program was always by design too. I, I think that Jeff Ruby was always where he thought um, he was going to have his final prep. Um, I heard Ravelli speak on it. Apparently, he had trained at Turfway before he came down to the fairgrounds. And, and I don't know how much time Ravelli spent down here. He only sent two horses down here, and they were under the care of uh, Louis Roussel in Louis Roussel's barn. Um, but he had apparently had trained at Turfway very well, and had gotten over to poly track very well. So I think that was his plan. When he came down here, he always worked well. Um, I, you know, I think he tipped his hand that he was a pretty good horse. One, one of the things, Jonathan, uh, I think it takes a – a pretty good horse to do is overcome trouble on a turn. You really never see cheap horses do that. A good horse will do that. He did it in his first start of his life at Churchill, sprinting. He got in trouble on the turn. He recovered and then finished a strong fifth in that race and then came back and graduated in his next start very comfortably at Colonial. Um, so the and one of the other things that I think is a good sign of how a horse, uh, their quality, is if they can work under a minute going five furlongs, easily and he did that at the fairgrounds um and so you know i know he's got some quality um his race is here in the lecompte and the risen star were both very good efforts um and i can't think you know knowing that the jeff ruby was always the goal to try to get their points going forward to the derby uh i think there was probably room for improvement he wasn't that far behind instant coffee in the lecompte and in the risen story wasn't that far behind angel of empire uh but it certainly looked like when he went to the Jeff Ruby, he found his preferred surface. And that drastic a jump in his speed figures on the speed figures that I use tells me that that's kind of led to why his number is so big. If the Derby was being run at Turfway, I think he'd be one of my top two choices. Since it's not, I'm hesitant to make him a top choice, but it wouldn't shock me if he's moved forward as much as some of his competition from the fairgrounds. I don't think he's the most likely winner, but it's real easy to pull for these connections. It's easy to pull for the small guys in this game these days, the way things are going. A uh, guy like Loveberry, I don't think the moment will be too big for him because he's been doing this a long time, but I am a little concerned that he's been outmounted since he's left the fairgrounds and he's not on that habit of winning on a daily basis like he was here at the fairgrounds. So that concerns me a little bit. I like Rodgers to be in the zone going into Derby week. I mean, you know, 
everybody remembers how Calvin was when he won with Mind That Bird. I mean, he couldn't lose that week. Everything everything he was getting on was riding great. And Ryder's just getting that zone. Um, so I, I, I think that's a little bit of a concern. But he's a solid horse. Um, he's going to get – he's got enough tactical speed that he's going to get into a good position. Well, we got to see how they draw. But provided he draws comfortably – he he can get into a good position. He's got enough experience and enough races, and I think this is always important. Horses that have enough experience in races leave the gate in the Derby. The lightly race wins, unless you know. If, now, granted, anybody can be, be bumped from one side or another, but those horses tend to break forwardly in the Derby. Um, they're more aware of the lightly race horses, like a horse like Mage. That that concerns me quite a bit. A horse like Mage with making only his fourth start, unless they're so much better than their generation at this time, like a Justify, or a uh, you know one of those types that that's just so forward that that they can overcome uh, their lack of experience. I think the experience really serves them well leaving the gate. Frank, you're you're entirely too legendary of a horse player for me to let you get away with here. Just talking about two fills. So if two fills isn't a horse that you you feel like is a is a likely winner of this race, who is a, a horse or two that you are interested in? Well, um, I'm I'm curious. You know, I want to see how they train this this next uh, Saturday. We're taping this on a Friday, eight days out. Um, but I like seeing horses that run through the wire at a mile and an eighth. I, I don't, I, my, in my opinion, a, a race like the Santa Anita Derby with all three horses were on the wire, they were kind of getting to the wire. A race like the Arkansas Derby, Angel of Empire was running through the wire. And that's the kind of horse and that's the kind of race that I'm looking for for a horse going into the Derby. I also liked his last week's work when he worked with Jace's Road, looked very relaxed. Um, I mean, when I saw what the fractions were, I wasn't, you know, it's a benefit when you get to watch them and you're not having to worry about the stopwatch. So you can really pay attention to how they're going. Then when I saw the fractions, the internal fractions of the work, it was very impressive. And he looks like he's coming into his own. And, and that barn seeding seems to have them uh, all going in the right direction these days. Well, Frank, I, we appreciate you. We got we got a hundred dollar uh, Preakness future wager for you um there's what 27 29 uh hopefuls who, who do you want to spend your uh, your hundred dollars on <laughs> right now uh, I, I, like i mentioned i'm trying to figure out who's going to win at keeneland today so, so you're asking me a long way out but why don't we do this why don't we keep it in the uh why don't we keep it in the barn and in the same barn and and uh, look for first mission who's being pointed to that race to step up and, and run a big race Frank, we appreciate you as always. Best of luck today at Keeneland and uh, next week uh, at Derby and Oaks. All right. Good luck with the Little League football team. <laughs> Thanks. Next up on the show, very happy to welcome back a man who's been on these airwaves a lot lately. He's coming to us from Dubai. He'll be here for the Preakness, Preakness Future Bet. We'll get to that in a minute. He's Michael Adolfson. Michael, what's going on? Thanks for having me again. And um, as always, just looking forward to these great races and always to get home to see some of the best horses in the world on Dirt Run. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Continue R, Michael. You made a compelling case for this runner when we talked a couple of weeks ago. Um, you've had more to see now. Where do you mm. currently stand with Continue R and his chances? I hate to say it, but I've lost a little bit of faith in him because I've just not liked the way he's been moving. Because I watched him move here for a, a good while, a good 10, 15 days. Um, and I just feel like he's not moving nearly as well as he did here over that, whether it's the surface, whether it's the horse himself. I'm not sure, but I mean, I think on pedigree, on on class, I think he does fit. It's just that that last work with Derma it was it was bad in the ways that a lot of people aren't really um, pointing out. I mean, the race, the, the 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 work itself went the way it's supposed to. Very Japanese, very much a blitz down the lane where they lead into it, and it was two separate works that they had going at the same time where one was supposed to be the lead horse, then they were probably supposed to finish together. And he just could not keep up with Derma Sotogake. And this is a horse that on form, he's not far. You've he's put a line to the UAE Derby for him. It's a bad ride that day. And he just did things didn't go well for him. Um, he on form, he's not, he's not far off of Derma Sotogake. And, and that work made him look like he's a, he's th two classes below him. Yeah. So well put, I think. Did it, I just, I, 
Does any part of you just want to use that work to elevate Derma Sotogake, though? Like, how do you how do you see that work from the other point of view? It's twofold, really. I mean, I think if you look at, if, like I said, it's kind of two works at the same time, and you're, you're watching one and watching the other. If you watch Derma Sotogake, you move him up because of how quickly, like, he wasn't really asked until the three furlong pole to do anything. And he grabbed a bit and went after Continuar on his own. Um, and that I loved. And so he wants to pass horses. He wants to click on. And then when he was asked to go, go at about 300 or the, the, the three sixteenths, um, he just went, I mean, he was a little sloppy, but he kicks on. I mean, and that's the thing. He's got a nice turn of foot, just like his daddy. And I think that there's stamina on the bottom there. I'm, I'm worried about the 10 furlongs a little bit, but then I compare it to how much well, I compare his class to the horses in this race. And there's no reason he shouldn't move up again, um, yeah, barring is he a, a little quirky? I, feel, I feel like not yeah, just in that so. work. Yeah, yeah I, not just in that work, but just when I've seen him out in the morning, he's throwing his head around. He's it, it, that's what maybe gives me a little bit of pause about the ten furlongs. Like, is he in? Are they just letting him be frisky in the morning, and he'll? You think he'll yeah. be all business when the gates pop, or or is this something we have to worry about in terms of him? I mean, if he's wasting energy throwing his head around, it's hard to see him seeing out ten furlongs to me. I I, I think that. I think they're what they're doing right now with him is just letting him be himself because part of why he's so good, I think, is that he is quirky. He is opinionated. He's got things that he wants to do. You know, um, I remember them quoting a quote about him. You know, he'll 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 spook at a, a bucket that he's seen nine times before. You know what I mean? Like he just has you know typical you know, brilliantly talented horse who just has his quirks. Um, I don't, I'm not worried about him washing out. I'm not worried about him wasting his race. I think you just let him be a strong opinionated horse because that's what he needs to be when they ask him to push the button like they did in that work. And he yeah, was yeah. an opinionated horse. He wanted to bury Continuar. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could see it. This is an yeah. alpha horse who wanted to crush his rival, and he did. And he yeah. knows that horse because they go out together, but he also knows it because they grit their teeth against each other, and they face, face each other, I think, four times now, so three times. So, there, yeah, this is a horse moving in the right direction. Continuar seems uh, – I loved him as a, as a piece of the race shot on pedigree, on trainer, on, on the way he runs. Um, he can put himself in the middle of the pack and then and improve from there. But I just um, – is my audio okay? You sound great, Michael. I was just dealing wow. with some uh, in-house stuff here. No, uh, no, I just wanted to, I was just worried about whether or not, you know, he would progress from the UAE Derby. That's continue our, but I'm worried that there might be something amiss here because he doesn't look like he's reaching out on the ground. He doesn't look comfortable in the lane. When he was asked, he switched leads um the wrong to the wrong lead in the stretch and he does not extend this extending the way i would prefer and to me uh he's not filling me with confidence that things might be going wrong with him in general because that race in dubai was worse than it, it was it was a bad ride they took him took him out too wide but at the same time he just didn't finish the way he should have I need a word from you about Mandarin Hero. We learned last year about horses sneaking in from the deeper AEs, and I don't want to have a situation where I don't have any word in the monster pot about the Derby winner two years in a row. So tell me what you think about Mandarin Hero. Should he make the gate? Is he a contender in this race? Could he be a contender in a race like the Preakness down the line? I mean, I think a horse that finishes a nose second in the Sandy to Derby should be in the field. I think that's something that should be remedied. Um, but that's a whole different conversation. I think that they're, with the horse himself, as an individual, there are two different narratives for me. There's one that says on pedigree, he's gonna, he's a miler. Uh, he's he's extremely, you know, tough. He's got middle mid pack kind of speed, and then he closes really well. We saw that, and he's not afraid to go between horses. I think pedigree wise, he's he's it's asking a lot of him to get the 10 furlongs against these types of horses at the same time that I can't see him winning and excelling more than these other class horses over 10 furlongs. I can see him picking up the pieces and just gritting out a fourth, fifth, sixth place win, you know, a finish, you know, like he's a horse. If you look at his record, you look at every single race that you can find on YouTube before and the race he ran at Santa Anita, he's always there. You know, he's and he puts himself into it and he's used to running around these tighter turn corkscrew tracks um, that he loves the grittiness of those tight races. You know what I mean? Like he gets in it and he's a horse that's made to come over here and do well.
do you, would you like him more in the Preakness? Very much so. Um, I think that that would suit him far better. And if, if he can't make it into this field, it might be a blessing in disguise. Speaking of the Preakness, Preakness Future Wager, you've got your hundred to spend in this bet any way you'd like. You could take Mandarin Hero. You could take one of the others. What are you thinking? Okay. Um, <laughs> Decision time. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is this is this is this is really tough. Actually, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little left field on this. Do it. Um, I would split it. I would I would if I could. If, if that's if I'm able to do that. And I would go 50 on a, on a long shot that I think could far improve in the Preakness. And Dale Romans has done it before. Yep. Of course, as we can expect. Um, I like Cyclone Mischief. I think that Pimlico was made for him. Um, and I liked his races. I liked the last time they took him back a bit. Or, you know, he for a little forced to go back. But um, And he still ran well. He's done. He's run different ways. He's, he's just, he seems like a pure runner to me with a trainer who excels with pure runners. Um, oh, nice, nice pedigree. Yeah. And, and he is, he is 51 to one, I believe right now I'm seeing one of the current odds. Um, and then if, if, if I'm splitting it in half and I'm going for a horse that I know will love on my own three sixteenths has already had one, a race over it. Um, and we just talked about him at 16 to one. I'm actually going to, uh, I was going to go with this arm on this, but I'm actually going to switch and go to Dermasotagake because I feel like he just might rock up in the Preakness. All right. Well, that's an interesting call for sure. Um, who knows? He could be going for a, a second leg of, of uh, the Triple Crown if all works well. Michael, thank you so much. We will see you in Baltimore and always appreciate you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. When it comes to handicapping the Kentucky Derby, Everybody wants a long shot. You know, we can come here and talk about the top of the market all we want, but a lot of the casual people, they're tuning in. They're wanting to know how their uh, $2 bet might get them back 100 I think we might be addressing that topic in this very segment. We bring in the editor of In The Money Plus. He is also the brains behind Thorough Pace, a new um, pace product for helping you find winners. He is Tyler Wisman. Tyler, what's going on? Ready for Derby, Pete. How are you? <laughs> Love it. Well, let's talk about this horse, Sun Thunder, a little bit. Uh, how did he get on your radar as a horse who might have a chance to hit the board or even do better than that in this year's Kentucky Derby? I think it, it honestly it didn't come about until following the, the last round of preps, right? When kind of reviewing the prep races, it, it really you know dawned on me that this horse really hadn't got the setup that he wants and needs. Uh, for his running style. And I think with that, I started to look a little bit deeper and the more I looked, the more I liked. So I'm not going to just try to make a, a cursory case for why you might want to think about Sun Thunder. Um, I, I do think that there is a legitimate case to be made that this horse um, definitely could hit the board at, you know, 40 to 50 to one, um, you know, what exact odds he is in the wind pool. I'm not entirely sure. Um, Obviously, a lot of that driven by Rich Strike and the phenomenon that we saw last year, I think will probably drive everyone's odds down a slight bit. But I do think, you know, in some of the exotic wagers, he's going to play pretty long um, for my estimation. So for, for the uninitiated, when you talk about a setup, what are you talking about? Right. And so you mentioned thorough pace and just uh, as a quick overview, right, we take a look at races and we assign a, a pace forecast and we have a 70 point scale going from minus 35. And if I see a race with minus 35 as the, the pace, I'm definitely looking for a horse that is on the lead, near the lead, speed horses. Um, so it's a speed favoring race shape. Right. Uh, and then conversely, horses near the front should do well. Exactly. And the plus 35, kind of the other end of that spectrum, I'm looking for a closer, a stretch runner, as we refer to them uh, by most people refer to them as closers. This is the type of, of horse or style that Sun Thunder has. So if I see a race that's more in that plus 35, I'm definitely going to gravitate towards Sun Thunder. I think the Derby last year is a good example of a race that is around the plus 35 where the speed sort of fell back. They went too fast early and Rich Strike comes, you know, up the rail and everybody knows the, the story from there, 80 to 1. Uh, and I don't think it's impossible while the, the, the pace is unlikely to be not nearly as fast as it was last year, it's still going to be honest. And I think that's where thorough pace can unlock value is it's all contextual, meaning let's look back at some of Sun Thunder's past races, see what the pace was there. 
And then I can try to articulate how he's going to get a much better setup in the Derby and he might be able to, you know, improve, uh, you know, and run true to his ability. That makes sense to me. Let's talk about him as an individual. Give us a little bit of an overview of his form. What type of figure you think he might be capable of running in a race like the Derby? Yeah, I mean, let's let's just start by saying that he's slow on all figures, right? Like, I'm I'm going to admit that, but again, again we'll, we'll try to build the case. So the connections, you know, Kenny McPeak definitely can be a sneaky trainer, knows how to win big races, um, gets the, the services of Brian Hernandez, who definitely knows the the Churchill Downs Oval quite well. Um, so I like the connections, right? He had a recent work earlier this week at the time we were recording this. Nothing flashy, but also nothing negative there. So I think he's coming into the race in, in good order. The pedigree, buy into mischief, you know, obviously sired, sired a couple derby winners at this point. Plenty of stamina on the, the damn side pedigree. Sold for $400,000 to, again, connections that are pretty sharp at identifying talent and then so you then you kind of move to the races right and debuts of the churchill down surface runs okay um you know i think that was the second stars of tomorrow card that he made his debut at the tricky uh seven furlong distance brad cox wins the race and heavily backed determinedly shoppers revenge was in that race and also exits that race to win so you know a promising debut and he then goes to a two-turn race at oakland park where he's bet down to you know basically odds on and i think that that's a race where he really shows his talent um i think you know if you're into replays it's worth watching because that horse course, um, you know, it, it almost went down around the first turn. He gets sort of pinballed in there. The the comment, I think, says steadied. I don't think that that's probably sufficient description. Uh, he then makes a, you know, a, what I would call like a menacing move around the second turn and just blows the field away. He did get Lasix. Um, and quite honestly, you know, I sort of treaded lightly from that point because the performance seems so well in that maiden win. Uh, but comes back in the southwest on a, a sloppy track. Um Runs okay, right? Arabian Night wins that race on the front end in a, a, a fairly even pace race, neutral pace. Uh, so it doesn't really get the setup for a style, but runs just fine. Um, and then we move to the key piece of form that I think my entire analysis is built on, and that's the Risen Star Stakes. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to say about the Risen Star Stakes. I, I think that the top three of that field um, are all very live uh, next week in the Kentucky Derby. So, you know, Sun Thunder split Angel of Empire in two fills. Again, Angel of Empire goes out of that race and wins the Arkansas Derby. Two fills comes out of that race, wins the um, the Jeff Ruby Stakes with a, a massive figure. Uh, he splits them, right? Uh, I also think that I like if you watch the replay. Unfortunately, you have to watch it it's kind of in the dark. Nevertheless, he kind of comes up the rail, which shows to me that he's comfortable inside. And that's the trip that I hope Brian Hernandez can give him in the Derby. If he's going to hit the board, he's going to need to save ground. One other thing about the Risen Star, most people look at that because they look at the chart and say, well, that race collapsed. The pace didn't hold. And while on the surface, that makes sense. We have that, again, going from minus 35 to plus 35 as a plus four. So that's a very neutral setting. So although he was you know, roughly 10th very early in that race, the field was very bunched up. And what's more important than the position of where the runners are is how many links off that actual pace are they. So I would say we have a more neutral stance on the Risen Star Stakes. I think it's an important race. He comes out of that race, goes to the Louisiana Derby, which has been – you know, very well documented. Kings Barnes was allowed to set a very easy pace in that race. As a closer, he did not get a chance to run his, his race. Um, it, he also had a little bit of trouble around the second turn, I would say, you know, not much, but definitely had to study. Um, so I'm kind of drawing a, a line through that race. I think Kenny McPeak thought, we're probably in the Derby, but let's not leave it to chance. So he comes back two weeks later, runs in the bluegrass. And it's another race where it gets a minus 14, right? So theoretically, I realized that Tapa Trice, um, he was about two links back further than Tapa Trice, by the way. Tapa Trice overcame that, won the race, um, which I think is actually a credit to him as opposed to an indictment of Sun Thunder for not getting up, right? So, you know, again, minus 26, the Louisiana Derby, minus 14 in the, the Bluegrass Stakes. And now we're getting to a situation where I expect it to be sort of plus 25, plus 26. If Cyclone Mos Mischief gets in, that will only get uh, get faster as the, the entries down the line get in, if, if you will. Um, and so with that, I think that this horse gets the best setup that he's had in 2023. Uh, I think he isn't going to struggle with the distance. I think he has the jockey to give him the right trip. And I think that there's a big shot that he hits the board at 40 to 50 to 1.
it's a very, very compelling case. And I hear you on that form case to the, you know, one length to Angel of Empire. And you, you explained about that trip. And I also don't know, you mentioned the run up the inside. I'm not sure the inside was necessarily the best part of the track there that day either. I'm I'm starting to hear you on this, uh, on this Sun Thunder case. Two quick pieces of business we need to do, Tyler, before we get out of here. The first one, I don't know if I told you about this yet, but everybody participating in this year's Monster Pod gets a hundred dollar wager in this Preakness feature future bet that you can find via your ADW starting on uh, April 28th. If I've got a hundred for you, should we just go ahead and put it on Sun Thunder for the Preakness, or would you want to go in? A, do you have a different early idea for the Preakness, including an all others type of a play? Oh uh, man, it's it's hard to know to see how the the betting shakes out, right? So I did take a look at the entries, and if I'm not mistaken, first mission was listed at thirty five to one. I'm not sure that that will necessarily hold up. Um, so I I think that that's an interesting price. Um, I'm not going to take a pass, right? Like I I do think that there's probably some runners that are more likely to progress on and run um, almost regardless, and I think Sun Thunder is actually one of those horses. I also think that. Um, you know, he's probably going to get pace that he would need in that. And if, if anything, you know, I'm not concerned about the distance, but the the, the lesser the distance with him, uh, the better. So maybe maybe we should make it Sun Thunder. We'll get, we'll get paid, it. right? Yeah, 100 on Sun Thunder for Tyler. And then the last little bit of business on the ITM plus side content coming down the pike. Some new ideas. I think we might have some reportage from the grounds from uh, Kevin Kilroy again this year. We're going to have our grid picks. Just a ton more info. There's a lot of great stuff you can get free on this YouTube channel from uh, In The Money Media Feed podcast from InTheMoneyPodcast.com. But if you want all our best stuff, you can join In The Money Plus today. What are you particularly looking forward to real fast about the Plus coverage this year? I think there's a couple of exclusive podcasts, right, where we try to cover uh, things that are, you know, there's so much attention with the Derby to a lesser extent, the Oaks. But, you know, I think really horse players on the day are going to be very interested in the two-day pick six. So we'll try to cover that. Um, and while we talk about the Derby, it's it's much you know, I'd say much more top heavy in terms of selection. Who do we think is going to win the race? But, you know, last year we had a popular segment on um, ITM Plus where Nick Tamaro walked through sort of his vertical wagering strategy. I think that was very popular. Um, so we'll try to replicate that. Um, and, you know, the, the the final thing that we'll do is, I, you know, I think that we'll have a, another late pick five um, exclusive content uh, podcast, if you will. And from there, we'll have our picks grid, which is always popular. And then the thing that I enjoy working on each year is a wagering guide, right? So a couple of different budgets. So, so you know, if your budget's two hundred and fifty dollars, it's your goals in the day are probably a little bit different than say if it's a thousand dollars, right? We try to take that into account um, and build some wagers, right? Like you, you kind of know my handicapping philosophy, and the idea behind our wagering guide isn't that you necessarily tail me in what I'm writing, but it's try to to lay out. Okay, these are my opinions on the day. These are my strongest opinions on the day, and this is how I plan to leverage them. So that's kind of the intent behind that. Um, you know, again, I think that for a lot of people, it's, it's a fairly popular uh, thing. And then, you know, the final thing I mentioned is we have 2022 uh, BCBC champ uh, Drew Coatney that's going to be doing some some written content and analysis for ITM Plus subscribers as well. So, you know, a ton of value for effectively what amounts to be $20. Tyler, thanks for all the work you do. Folks should check out in the money plus they should also check out thorough pace give them with a quick pretty link on that and then we're done yeah so in the money podcast.com slash thorough pace t-h-o-r-o-p-a-c-e in the money podcast.com slash thorough pace we'll see you soon thanks pete Next up on the show, somebody I'm very happy to have back in the fold, does a lot of Derby content with us. We'll be at the Derby this year working for World Horse Racing. You can follow her on Twitter and get all that info. We'll have her give you that. And hopefully we'll be doing some stuff as well, talking about uh, my friend, my colleague, my my co-Eclipse winner. You can see the statue has made it to the background here in the bunker. Naomi Tucker. Naomi, what's going on? Oh, good. Yeah, I literally just got to Louisville. I'm nice. in be trying to figure out what's up and down super excited to be going to the track tomorrow and have a look at all the runners themselves because i love to seeing them in the flesh so yeah it's going to be an exciting uh, renewal again this year and hopefully it stays dry but the forecast is pretty good it was a little bit of sprinkle uh, earlier today but i've been checking the forecast quite a bit it's supposed to stay dry so good. 
take that into account when you're, when you're obviously looking at your uh, Kentucky Derby runners. Fingers crossed. Can't wait to see you out there. I know you'll be putting a lot more content out via World Horse Racing. Be looking at them in the morning. We're going to want to follow that. What's the best place for people to get your World Horse Racing content? Um, World Horse Racing is uh, at WHR on uh, Twitter, as well as World Horse Racing on Instagram, World Horse Racing on TikTok, uh, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, we'll be posting on all those platforms. Keeps us busy. <laughs> Love it. And what about for people, to, you know, they should all be following you too. What's the best way to do that? Uh, at Naomi Tucker on uh, Twitter. That, that's where I tend to post my content. So I'll try and get some videos uh, on there as well. And uh, get some derby picks out once I've played Great. On some of them. So, yeah. I, I may try to photobomb you at some point. Let's talk about reincarnate this uh, Tim Yakteen trained Johnny Velasquez uh, ridden, uh, you know, in the last start uh, contender for this race. What do you think about this one and uh, his chances on the first Saturday in May? Well, see, Reincarnate was primarily trained by Bob Bafford. We know that the horses that were on the Kentucky Derby Trail ended up being moved to Tim Yaktina. If you look at his record in the Kentucky Derby, hasn't hasn't been able to make it down yet. Had Teba and Messier last year under that same kind of circumstance as what I just mentioned. And um, I just look back at Reincarnate's Arkansas Derby, just trying to you know trying to to see if I had any excuses for him. He was pressing the pace quite a bit that day. He did a fair bit of work there, just sitting off it. When you just look at the PPs, it looks like he kind of folded late. But if you look at the actual visual replay, he was still fighting and there was a whole wall of horses that was coming at him and he had his airspin back and he was still trying. So those are kind of the positive notes. Also positive notes, he's never uh, been off the board. Look at his record, right? He's ultra consistent. The only problem is though, when you look at the races since that grade three sham at Santa Anita, he's been trending downwards when it comes to his buyers. And when you're looking at some of the three-year-olds he's going up again, they've been trending upwards. You're looking at horses that are running mid nineties to triple digit buyer numbers. So when I look at reincarnate for this is Kentucky Derby, he's going to have to turn things around. And right now he doesn't seem to be going in that right direction. And I would be worried that they tried to send him close to the pace again and that he might not be able to hold off the closers like you were seeing in the Arkansas Derby that tried to pick him up. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a reasonable fear for sure. What do you think about him as an on the board chance, maybe more of an underneath type? Is he is do you think he's too slow for that? Do you think he'll like the mile and a quarter and, and any particular notes as far as, you know, uh, where he might end up? Well, for what's that so consistent, you kind of want to make that argument, right? Why wouldn't he hit the board? The only thing is my fear is that going that mile and a quarter, I'm, I'm worried it's going to catch him out. I'm worried that it, in those in that final quarter, he's going to be struggling a little bit like you saw in the Arkansas Derby and that he might get found out. So unless you're getting a really good price on him, then yes, by all means, should be fun to have a few dollars each way. I, I'm, I must admit, I think I'm going to, hold off on that one as well. He just isn't trending in that direction that I'm hoping to see. And I don't think the distance is going to help him in this case. I do want to give you a chance to, you know, we're not going to hold your feet to the fire for final selection. Obviously what you see over the course of the next few days will inform that, but are you leaning in any particular direction right now? Um, I was already mentioning this to you before the call. There's one horse that I was really impressed with. I saw him in the flash um, at Keelan in the bluegrass. That is verifying for trainer Brad Cox. Of course, we know that Tappet Trice ended up beating him, but that was such a strong battle between the two of them. I thought verifying ran a stronger race because he was much more forwardly placed than Tappet Trice really was working for it, was, you know, on the lead from the majority of time, at least the second half of the race, and then put his ears back down and really, really gave it his all. Just got beaten. But look, 99 buyer career best, th this horse is seemingly getting better. And like I said, that's what you want to see going into this derby, right? A horse that is on the upswing. He has that right kind of running style. He's close to the pace, doesn't necessarily need the lead. He's one from kind of just off it as well. So I find him really interesting, hoping that get a bit of a price on him. Because there's a fair few horses in this year's Kentucky Derby that you can make a, a case for. It's not just all 40 not in my book anyway i think there's a lot of interesting horses in this year's derby and that makes it fun definitely and you'll get some clues in terms of who's coming into it the right way out there in the mornings follow world horse racing follow naomi we're going to give you a pass for now on the preakness future bet but 
You and I will have a little conversation online this week about where you want to put your $100, give you a chance to get uh, organized on that one. And uh, we'll be back with you very soon. Sounds good. Doogie, what's going on? JK, what's happening? Man, just uh, it's it's uh, it's upon us. It's Derby. Are you going this year? Yep, back to the Derby again. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Millionaires yeah, row up top fun. again. Yeah, I'll be up on uh, fourth floor, I believe. Um, my wife's going, and uh, we got a good group. Same, pretty much same as last year. So it'd be be a lot of fun. Always is. That's awesome. Well, even before Skinner got into the race, um, when we were doing this list of who was going to talk about which horse. Um, Pete, let me know that you were really interested in Skinner. So it, it actually works out now that he's in the field. What What is it about Skinner that has your interest? Well, um, I think this year Skinner has just been sort of just pointed for a race just like this. Like he, he reminds me a little bit of Giacomo in the, in the sense that he raced, I think Giacomo raced one more time up to this point than Skinner. But he has similar form. Giacomo ran fourth in the um, in the San Anita Derby in uh, what was that in 2019, I think. Um, and he's had Skinner's just had some of these rides where he just kind of like makes these big bursts and then kind of then he just kind of just coasts in after that. He doesn't seem to have that full full burst and keep it going. But I think you know those kind of horses they learn a little bit. And he's I think in the last couple of races, he's learning a little bit more and a little bit more. And he's not necessarily showing it in his speed figures, but he's showing it in the way he's running. I think he's just, um, I think he's a horse that can, that can surprise. And not only that, I think he's a horse that should hit the board. Outside of Skinner, um, who, who else kind of has your interest? You know, I, you know, uh, uh, you've been going to a lot of derbies. You've been playing this game for a very long time. I uh, want to make sure we get your opinion on what you think uh, about some of the other horses you're interested in. You know, you know, it's funny. I've had a little bit of success on this on this monster pod. You know, I had Country House the one year, and then I think one year I did it. The horse didn't run the derby, but he won the Preakness. I think it was Ron Bauer in 2021. So. I mean, I've had some good derbies. I haven't had the greatest success in derbies, except for, you know, maybe um, way back. I used, used to be, uh, used to seem like I'd look forward to betting the derby. I mean, lately, it just seems to been really hard with these 20 horse fields. But this year is so wide open. Um, I don't normally take horses that have, you know, the recency, the form, but I, I kind of like the way Tappet Trice runs. He just seems like he's a grinder. And horses in the Derby, I think that can be put into the race and keep running. I think those kind of horses are the ones that um, you got a key on. I don't, I don't like those one run closers and, and you know, not necessarily a dead speed horse because it's a mile and a quarter. But this year looks like the race lacks a little pace. And I'm hoping they put Tappet Trice in the race like they did at Keeneland. And uh, he was very impressive to run down that horse that I, that got away from him. So I think um, I think he's just a solid you know, he runs low hundred figures and he, and nobody else really does. And uh, I think he's just, I think he's the horse. What are your thoughts with the favorite with Forte? I mean, obviously he's been impressive uh, in, in the races that he's won and how many good races he's won and he's consistent. I think he's won four grade ones. What, what is your, but he's, but his figures aren't very fast. So what are your kind of feel? What's your feel on Forte? Is he a, is he a use for you? Is he a horse that, that you'll be using in the pick six? Or is he a horse that you'll just kind of be fading or be using defensively? I think you said it right at the end, using defensively, because he's – it's hard to bet on him with the with the low figures. I mean, it, that race at Gulfstream is so weird, that mile and an eighth race. I don't know what it is, but it's so hard to get a line on because that first turn comes up fast and, and the horses seem to get lost in that race a lot of times. And he did something that – you know, good horses do. He got, he got in trouble turning for home and still managed to, to, to run past a, you know, a somewhat decent horse in, in mage. And, you know, I, I don't know what that feel was like. So it's just a hard horse. I mean, he wins and he wins and he wins, but it's a hard horse to, to just say, you're going to key him. You know what I mean? He's just one of those horses. I just can't really, I can't really depend on, he could run nowhere. You know what I mean? It's like, he's, if he gets, if he gets in trouble in a 20 horse field, he could just, he could be nowhere. So it's not, he's not my type of horse to, to key on. 
Duke, it's uh, th- this this monster podcast is sponsored by the the Preakness Future Wager. Uh, I sent you those past performances. You got a hundred dollar free wager uh, there. Who who do you want to bet that hundred on? Well, I mean, uh, I think I have to bet Skinner. I'm hoping that uh, you know, John Sheriff seems like he w- if he's going to run in the Triple Crown, maybe he he'll, he'll just uh, he'll keep running even if he hits the board. So I'll bet I'll bet it on the horse that we're doing the pot on. I'll bet a hundred on Skinner. I love it. Duke, I appreciate it. Best of luck uh, today, uh, every day, and uh, next week in the Derby. Thanks. I need it. I can do it.